Welcome to the New Books Network. Good day. Welcome to New Books in Military History. I am Boris Scarpa, and today we have with us a somewhat unusual guest for our show. Usually we have historians, we have military veterans. Today, however, we have with us Dr. Thomas Hutton, who is actually a a behavioral neurologist and an expert in Parkinson's disease, who has researched Parkinson's disease at Texas Tech, and as well as uh, I understand that, uh, uh, Tom, you've headed a Parkinson's Research Center. And of course, um, Dr. Hutton is the author of Hitler's Maladies and Their Impact on the Second World War, A Behavioral Neurologist View. Welcome to our show, Tom. Well, thank you, Boris. I'm, I'm really honored to be on your show. Now, we are, you know, we are creatures of of tradition on this show. We, uh, all, you know, this is a show which is for people, some of whom are readers of books, some of them are readers and also writers. Some of them are even writers who are, who are only writers and not readers, but I've not yet met one. And for this reason, one of the traditional questions we always have is why you have chosen as a subject. Uh, you know, of course, Hitler is a very prominent villain of history, and everybody wants to ask, you know, looking at Hitler, what the hell is wrong with you, dude? And so, uh, <laughs> why, uh, but I still like to ask why you have chosen this particular uh, subject. Oh, yes, Boris. Like everyone else, I was fascinated by the evil dictated dictator Adolf Hitler. But in my work on Parkinson's disease, I learned fairly early on about his having had Parkinson's disease. I learned that from a close colleague of mine, Dr. Abraham Lieberman. Uh, Later in my own work, particularly dealing with Parkinson's and behavioral aspect of Parkinson's disease, I learned that um, There was a particular neuropsychological syndrome that we were finding, that others were finding and publishing the literature, and that in our own work, we found that our patients who had Parkinson's disease for 10 years or longer showed this particular abnormality in their cognitive functioning that I thought would have affected Adolf Hitler's behavior. And so I began to look into that more and uh, began to try to apply that to some of his decision-making, which had proven faulty. I began with particularly the Battle of Normandy. So that, that's how I pretty much got interested in the topic of Parkinson's and Hitler, particularly the behavioral aspects of that. Uh, about five, six years ago, we published a, a, an earlier book, Carrying the Black Bag, a neurologist's bedside tales. And one chapter in there actually was about Adolf Hitler and the Battle of Normandy and his particular neuropsychological problems. Uh, This uh, chapter, even though he certainly wasn't my patient, whereas all the other stories were about my own patients, the story was simply too good to leave out. And my editor and many readers encouraged me to expand that chapter into a full book and to make it more comprehensive and deal with his other medical problems, such as his heart disease, his gastrointestinal problems, his drug usage, and many other minor ailments, to give a fuller picture of how his health may have impacted World War II. Uh, My own belief was that while there have been literally hundreds and hundreds of books written about Adolf Hitler, there have been a relatively small number of books written about his health and its impact. And what has been written so often is inaccessible to the general reader. And many of the books are quite old and out of date. And the medical knowledge was uh, insufficient, I thought, to, uh, to convey the significance of Adolf Hitler's poor health and its impact. And, you know, from this, I want to ask, you know, some of people, and as I said, who are listening to our show, are working on their own writing, 
and as a reason they listen, they might want to get some insights from the experience of other writers, and clearly you've written several books, and I'd like to ask, uh, when you were working on this book, which uh, clearly is a, is a very detailed work addressing many aspects, you know, uh, cl- I uh, appreciate the hard work that went into this, and so I would like to ask, can you tell us about some of the challenges, some of the biggest challenges you've encountered when you were writing this book, and of course, uh, how these challenges were overcome i'd be pleased to uh, boris uh, the biggest problem was to try to lose some of my medical uh, scientific writing uh, like you boris i'm sure every every field has its own lingo and in terms of medical writings there were a number of bad habits you might say that i had acquired i'd edited some eight uh, books i had over a hundred articles and chapters and in most of those, they had to be very brief. Uh, that There's so much passive voice used, unfortunately, in medical writings. And I had learned never, ever try to use a metaphor or a simile so that medical scientific writing so often comes across as, frankly, rather boring. Uh, when I decided that I wanted to write for a general audience following my retirement, It took some time to try to learn how to write for a general audience, and actually I began taking coursework at our local uh, teaching site of Texas Tech University, and after three or four years of taking courses and uh, working with various critique groups, I felt like I was able to uh, get rid of many of my bad habits from medical scientific writing and hopefully being able to write in a more engaging fashion for a general audience. That's been my goal in in writing this book, was to try to make this information, which is sometimes buried in rather turgid uh, uh, volumes and it's very inaccessible, a lot of these written by psychoanalysts or psychologists, psychiatrists, and so forth. I wanted to try to make this more accessible to a general reader, because I think there's a good story here and it really helps us to better understand some of Adolf Hitler's catastrophic uh, errors in uh, directing uh, the German forces in World War II. Well, um, I think you know my, I I'm a part of the general audience here because I'm not not a physician by any means. I I think you you really I I hope that I understood everything. Um, so oh, I think you, it was more accessible to me than some of the military history writing which I sometimes read. And you know I'd like to ask you. You know, it's always difficult in my mind, especially when you're talking about um, such a villainous character as Adolf Hitler, where on one hand we want to talk, you know, about as a, as a uh, personal issues which he had, whether it's, you know, the disorders which he suffered from, you've listed a number of medical issues which he had in your book. Um, you know, so some of the drugs which he may have taken, or which which he has taken, or he ha- might have had a some say, some say a dependency on, or you know, this bad childhood which he had, which was you know, judging by every biography of Hitler, had clearly a really terrible childhood, and we need to talk about these things. And on the other hand, we don't want to we don't want to say that well, Hitler is not to blame. This is George, all this awful stuff happened to him, and that's why. Uh, so. How how do we square the circle between, you know, explaining things and excusing things? Yes, Boris, that has seemingly been a major problem in how historians address the topic and how physicians and psychologists have addressed the topic. I think there has been a great deal of concern among historians that even by talking about the medical problems or psychological problems that Hitler had, that this somehow would excuse his behavior. Uh, Whereas the psychologists and physicians are willing to write about his physical and mental uh, problems, uh, they sometimes have a hard time, have had a hard time applying that to uh, the historical aspects. I, I think that this this argument is uh, is unnecessary. Uh, clearly, his his behavior was abnormal. 
he had a very unusual uh, personality. He was quite uh, charismatic, uh, but he was a narcissist. He was a grandiose narcissist. And I think there may be some reasons in his childhood, as you mentioned, for this with his abusive, alcoholic, uh, doctrinaire father and his fawning mother. Uh, so that he grew up not feeling as if the law really applied to him. But he's not the only person who has grown up in a bad childhood. Uh, Albert Einstein had a somewhat similar childhood and was beaten, as was Adolf, and look what happened to him. He certainly developed a good sense of ethics and morals. So that, that in no way excuses him. When it comes to Adolf Hitler's physical health, which he had some major problems. He was an ill man with his advanced Parkinson's disease toward the end of World War II, and also with his coronary artery disease, both of which would predictably shorten his life expectancy. So he, there was a, an imperative there for Hitler to move ahead, I think. We go into this in the book as to why in the world of the launch uh, Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941, when the Germans did not even have a full stock of conventional weapons, much less the wonder weapons that were due out in the mid-1940s. But all of these illnesses, as bad as they were, and the Parkinson's disease, which gave rise to his mental inflexibility, along with his lifelong stubbornness, uh, these developed decades after his he, he had determined his anti-Semitism and his hatred uh, for the Jewish Bolshevik state, as he referred to it. And so that while these physical illnesses impaired his performance, they in no way caused it. So there is no reason in the world, in my view, for his culpability to be reduced in any way by his uh, medical problems. You know, I would like to swerve a bit to an episode of Hitler's life, which, you know, I remember reading about this when I was a schoolboy, and it had stunned me, you know, um, even at that time. The story of Hitler, you know, where he is in the hospital, and he he, he is injured, he has an unrelated injury, and he... Um, receives news. He receives news of uh, armistice being signed and effectively Germany has surrendered. It has lost the First World War. And, you know, while the full effects weren't determined yet, the negotiations weren't yet done, but it was clear that Germany had lost. And Hitler loses his eyesight. He 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 becomes blind almost I think entirely and it takes him quite a while to recover his eyesight again and the notion of somebody who's so horrified by his nation losing a war that he goes blind it's it's all it's always fascinated me and so I'd like to ask can you explain a bit about the connection between Hitler's, you know, patriotic, nationalist worldview at the time? How it could have been such, such was it really such a big part of his personality that it that it was personally traumatic to him to this extent to to actually cause blindness? I, I'd be pleased to to address that. Um... He had just learned the news, as you say, about the Germans surrendering in World War I. And he was mentally, emotionally unable to deal with this, what he saw as catastrophic news, and felt that his efforts and efforts of his comrades had been for naught that those who had negotiated for Germany had done a very poor job doing so. They gave up too easily, and he simply was unable to deal with this. In neurological terms, he had what's known as an hysterical reaction, or in psychiatric terms, developed a conversion reaction because of his inability to deal with these developments. Um, as, as such, he lost his vision. 
in a psychosomatic way. It wasn't something he was feigning. A conversion reaction is believed to be due to these deep-seated psychological difficulties in dealing with what was being faced. I used to see these reactions as a practicing neurologist, particularly in people who were seeing the world in fairly black and white terms, uh, people who were psychologically unsophisticated, oftentimes not having much education. Uh, frankly, all of those factors applied to Hitler. He had very little education, uh, less than a high school education, was unsophisticated in terms of the world, and he certainly was stubborn and did not have a lot of emotional insight. I believe why he lost his vision was uh, purely a conversion reaction. And when uh, the doctor treating him, a Dr. Forster, was treating him, he probably found some way to work him out of this conversion reaction when the conversion reaction no longer served its purpose. I used to do this with patients who might have developed a hysterical walking problem or vision loss or balance problem, uh, something that was clearly psychosomatic. And once these people were given a reason that it no longer served their psychological needs, a faux treatment of some type could be provided, uh, something like a black box treatment, which provided a small degree of electrical current that, of course, was meaningless in terms of therapeutic value. But once that was applied, give the patient a face-saving way to get rid of the symptoms, it was uh, very effective. And so I, I believe that something like that may have happened to Adolf Hitler uh, when it no longer served his purpose, and he was able to eventually uh, get over his uh, conversion reaction, hysterical reaction, hysterical blindness. Uh, this is an interesting uh, topic uh, for neurologists to deal with, for psychiatrists to deal with. And as you mentioned, uh, it probably, in Hitler's case, uh, set him up somewhat for his lifelong pursuit of trying to overcome what was Germany's uh, defeat in World War I and uh, try to square this uh, in the future by his... Um, his evil deeds. I would like to zoom in on something which you said because it it's strongly reminiscent to me of, of some of the things which I've learned from some of the books on uh, post-traumatic stress disorder where one of the strong theories in this field is that the, the it's much like li more likely for combat veterans to review to have a strong personal trauma where in the situations where there is a perceived unfairness by their superiors, and it's it's striking to me. It's very striking to me that even at this early stage on in his life, um, Hitler processes something which has happened. You know, in the political field, really, not personally to him, uh, and he processes this as this deep uh, injustice, this the deep uh, It certainly sounds like even uh, you know in his memoirs he talks about having visions of his um, of his mother being injured and abused uh, you know when he was you know dreams which he had about this when he was uh, having these medical problems and so he there's clearly in his there's some kind of personal and ideological thing where he perceives these injuries to germany as if they are the, like as if they were a personal he processes them as a personal trauma Yes, that's a very interesting observation, Boris. I, he, he, he tended to uh, try to deal with these societal issues, political issues, but no doubt much of this came from his own life, where I know some writers have said that along with Adolf being beaten by his follow, father, Alois Sr., also Adolf's mother was beaten 
particularly if she tried to interfere with the father in his um, a beating of uh, Adolf and Alois Jr. So I, I, I think that's a very interesting observation to carry over from his, his youth, his own personal experience, sad experience as it was, in trying to then generalize that to society and, of course, try to find some scapegoats along the way to blame. And this strong, this strong extreme nationalism, which is so strong, so ideologically bound with San Hitler, that he processes political events as personal ones, this is already in place at this time. Yes, that's a very good observation, and it was. It was early, early on. Uh, showed it reared its ugly head. And so, um, uh, I'd like to um, I'd like to talk about um, um, I'd like to talk first of all about um, a subject which always I'm going to change the order of the questions which was originally planned because I want to first talk about uh, something w which is very often discussed, you know, in public. There have been several very controversial books. And as we know, Hitler used uh, a lot of, uh, had, uh, had administered to him a lot of different substances, which, um, you know, today are, you know, you know there, there was uh, amphetamines. In some cases, there was small doses of cocaine. There was, Eucodal was issued, uh, uh, according to some uh, sources, uh, uh, twice or thrice a week. Uh, some other, uh, some other. Uh, Belladonna was also he. He also used it because, f f as I understand, for, for his speeches. Mm. Do you say first of all? Do you think that Hitler was, in the modern sense, addicted to any of these substances? And the second thing is, do you think that these may meaningfully had, you know, did they disrupt his way of thinking? Uh, yes, I, I do believe that he was dependent upon these various drugs, uh, likely was addicted. Uh, I know Theodore Morel made an attempt on the eucodal, which is hydrocodone, to limit it to every other day. However, I think he also failed in this result and gave in to whatever Adolf Hitler felt like he needed. The methamphetamine was given uh, frequently. Uh, gosh, Adolf Hitler just had a potpourri of uh, drugs, the hydrocodone, eucoidal, methamphetamine, cocaine, barbiturates, probably to help him sleep. And I do believe, in addition, Hitler may have had a Parkinson's-related sleep disorder. And then also toward the end of his life, he was being treated with two medicines that are referred to as anticholinergic medicines for his uh, tremor. But he also throughout his life took something for his uh, irritable bowel syndrome, which had an anticholinergic in it. All of these have some effect on cognitive function and memory function. Uh, that is a tremendous and baffling array of, uh, of drugs with potential drug-drug interactions occurring. I do believe that the drugs were having some effect, particularly late in the war when Morel was increasing the usage of these various medicines for Hitler. And Hitler was demanding that they be used because he it was at a point where he couldn't function without them. I think he was slowing up due to his Parkinson's disease. His thinking was slowing up. His movements were slowing up. And that Morel, who until very late didn't even recognize the Parkinson's disease, he was a general physician with very little knowledge of neurological topics. He was treating Hitler with a variety of these medicines to try to make him more functional. Uh, realizing the important is a, when your patient is a dictator, as yes, you, you can, you know, kill people if they displease him, and you don't really have a lot of, you know, lever. You know, it's difficult to, to to say no. I will not give you this medicine. It's bad for you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And I just like to like zoom a, bit, a little bit to zoom in about the drug use, which I understand mostly is during the war already. 
Uh, would you repeat um, that? First of all, I understand that most of the drug use is, however, after the war has started. Yes. Or originally, the, the drug usage, uh, Memorial didn't come along until about 19, uh, let's say about 1936. And he really wasn't, I don't think at that point, on that much medications. Uh, Morell began to treat him with uh, a whole variety of things, believing that heroic efforts were needed uh, to treat him. And he wanted to be a, appear to as if he was doing something to help Adolf Hitler, uh, because um, he was an interesting uh, physician who was uh, very upwardly mobile and realized that Hitler was his meal ticket to fame and uh, fortune. I very much like the euphemism upwardly mobile here. <laughs> but this question I would like to ask, I, I, don't, I have never consumed any of these drugs. I would like to uh, briefly... If I took, if somebody, if a healthy person, a regular person, they took amphetamines, they took uh, uh, these, uh, you've said oxycodone, if you, t if you took these substances at the frequency at which they were prescribed to Adolf Hitler, you would, would you then, uh, would you then become addicted? Would this, um, would this person be defined as addicted if they came in for treatment and they said, look, I take oxycodone every other day, I take amphetamine with this and this frequency. Would you say this person is having, is, uh, would you define this as a, as, a, as a dependency on these drugs? I think it's very likely that there was a dependency on these drugs. Uh, Leonard Heston has probably written the best book on Hitler's amphetamine usage and his dependency on this. And I believe there's evidence from that book and from the medical records that Hitler simply couldn't function without those amphetamine injections that he was receiving. They were restorative in a way that was dramatic uh, when Hitler was barely moving and he had an important meeting coming up and he would receive some treatment and all of a sudden he would like the phoenix, arise from the ashes and go forth and um, be effective. But and here I would like to, you know, this is our main, you know, our, our main, main, main course. Yes, we were going towards this entire interview. Uh, you know, the, I, uh, I would like, of course, uh, some viewers might have guessed that this was going to happen. I'm going to talk now about uh, Parkinson's disease. Um, and you've, uh, there's a, you, this is a subject which you are an expert in, and a substantial, a substantial part of your book is dedicated to discuss evidence that Adolf Hitler has uh, suffered from Parkinson's disease, and that it has affected uh, not only his wartime decision making, but maybe even early on his thinking and his writings. And so, because I, uh, because I don't, I'm not, um, I, I think that it might be, uh, it might be valuable. It might be valuable to our audience if you explain to, to us well, what does Parkinson's disease do to your thinking, to your ability to, uh, for, for maybe how it has affected Hitler. I'd be pleased to, to talk about that, Boris. Uh, uh, he had some rather subtle onset of his Parkinson's disease, probably beginning in 1933, certainly 1934. It probably appeared as his first uh, symptom, a lack of arm swing on the left side. Now, that's something most people don't even notice as someone stops swinging an arm. But for Parkinson's disease, this is a frequent first presenting symptom when the arms stop swinging uh, in such a way when someone is walking. Uh, the arm also will tend to turn around so that the back of the hand leads is so-called ape-like or simian posturing of the hand along with the lack of arm swing. Also developing in Adolf Hitler was a problem with his handwriting. It's called micrographia. And if we look at a series that we have examples in the book of his handwriting, what was his handwriting before he developed Parkinson's, and then throughout the course of his Parkinson's disease, 
the handwriting goes through typical changes where perhaps initially the first letter is, is pretty normal and then there's a rapid tapering off. And over the years, the handwriting becomes illegible. It just looks like chicken scratching. So the micrographia was a uh, early finding and, uh, which we see in his signature. Uh, he also then developed uh, the classical findings of Parkinson's disease, the slow hand tremor, the three to five cycle per second tremor, the fingers and the hands, the slowness of movement. Uh, we can't really tell if he was stiff or not, but that is one of the classical features, a certain muscular rigidity that goes. And then as the disease progresses, the, the walking becomes changed. It's a slow, slower pace, shorter stepped gait. The posture becomes stooped. The person loses their usual facial expression. It, it's called hypomimia. Uh, it's more blank expression. The blinking frequency is reduced. All of these uh, come together to show the full picture of idiopathic Parkinson's disease. Uh, what we've learned uh, and why I wanted to talk about the date of onset of his Parkinson's disease was from our own laboratory research. We learned if someone had these symptoms for 10 years or longer, that's when we always found in our patients a particular behavioral abnormality. It's neurologically speaking, a frontal lobe, a mild frontal lobe syndrome or an executive dysfunction where people have difficulty in changing uh, sets, what's known as changing sets in psychological terms. In uh, typical um, uh, language, we just say a person has difficulty in changing from one thought to another. There is a certain mental rigidity, a mental stickiness that comes on. And 10 years after the onset of his Parkinson's disease predated, for example, the Battle of Normandy and certainly the Battle of the Bulge. So Hitler's difficulty in changing thoughts, such as where the battle was going to be fought at Normandy, believing uh, for excessively that it was going to come at the Pas de Calais rather than on the beaches of Normandy and delaying the counterattacks by two days. Um, Tom, I would like just to clarify, because it was not clear to me, and it might not be clear to our audience, when you say uh, mental stickiness, uh, um, difficulty in the ch do you mean that there is a difficulty in changing one's opinion about the subject, or is this about something else? <laughs> what does it mental stickiness a, mean? Well, it means changing from one thought to another. It's a mental rigidity. It's a slowness to be able to evolve one's thinking as additional information becomes available. It's a type of inflexibility of thought. And of course, that meshed in nicely with Adolf Hitler's lifelong stubbornness, which he probably got from his father, who was equally as stubborn. So it was a perfect storm, I think, between his pre-morbid personality and his mental inflexibility of Parkinson's disease. Can I ask, you know, and because I'm from a different background, I'm from a history of ideas, and it seems to me like this is, again, something which it could have also dovetailed with, you know, how a lot of fascist ideologies and how national socialism particularly, you know, there's always an idea in these, in these sort of movements that, you know, if you are not willing to change your mind, that this is that this sh that this shows that you are actually strong and brave and uncompromising and dedicated to your cause. Because this, and we we see this in Hitler's writings and in the writings of uh, some of his associates, where they talk about fanaticism as a virtue. That, that, do you think that there could have been some dovetailing also between Hitler's ideology and um, his, you know? Uh, which could have led him to think, oh, I'm not being stubborn, I'm not being, I'm not having difficulty accepting, I mean, no, I'm being strong and brave. I, I think that's a, a very interesting idea, Boris, and I, and I think there's something to that, and not only for Hitler himself, but for those around him as a sort of reinforcing mechanism for the, uh, the, the, the fascist ideology. 
So, uh, and, and I think the the followers would likely have seen that as a as a plus. Uh, up until a point, uh, I think his generals, when in the midst of a of, of a battle, when things are changing, uh, when uh, the strategy or the tactics rather need to be changed in response to new new changes, uh, they became quite frustrated with Hitler and his slowness to transition to a more effective uh, uh, defense. So I, I think in general, you're right. Uh, over time, but in the short term, I think it probably uh, his generals became more and more frustrated with him, as you know, and uh, even to the point of um, attempt assassinations. You, I find it fascinating the idea that uh, somebody's somebody's health issues and you know the the inherent um, inherent features of their characters might dovetail with the in an unhealthy way with whatever ideologies they choose to adapt. And, it, it's, 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 and we, we can see it in some interactions with Hitler, which uh, some of the people who met him uh, talk about. But the, I, the thing which I would like to uh, zoom in on a little bit is... Uh, at this inflexibility, do you, do, based on the timeline which you've just talked about, when you said that uh, Hitler has probably started developing the, mm, the Parkinson's uh, disease uh, early after he has uh, come to power, or maybe around this time, and by the time of it was in, in, during the war, it was already in full swing. What I uh, when did it? When would it have started really affecting his thinking? Would, would this be already in the nineteen thirties, or would this be only after the war started? Well, I need to answer that in in two different ways, uh, Boris. I, I think in terms of the Parkinson's related mental inflexibility, while it may have occurred prior to ten years, uh, I think that it probably played a much greater role toward the end of World War II. But the fact that he had Parkinson's disease and coronary artery disease, both of which would have predicted he would be dead by the mid-1940s, I believe his, his knowledge of, and, and he, he knew he had coronary artery disease, he knew he had angina pectoris, while he might not have known what to cause, call his Parkinson's disease, he knew it was slowing him up. And uh, he felt like all his life that he wasn't going to be long lived, so that I believe this caused him a medical imperative to start the invasion of the Soviet Union earlier. Uh, historians have debated why in the world that he invade Soviet Union in 1941 rather than wait till England had been defeated and they had their full stockpile of conventional weapons and their wonder weapons and so forth, their full personnel, uh, I think that his uh, uh, egomania required him to start the war early, thinking that only he could lead this and achieve Lebensraum and, and deal with the Soviet Union. So I think his, uh, his awareness of his failing health was a factor, along with the health itself, particularly the Parkinson's disease causing the mental inflexibility later in the war. So long before, before even he's actually, you know, he actually starts, uh, before, even before the, the very sick Hitler, which was whom we see in, the, in, the, in 1943, who is by that point a, clearly an, an ill person, but long before this, he, we, he knows that something is up, and, he, and because he believes he's the only one who can do it, long before you know he starts slowing, you know, falling apart, so to speak, he 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 thinks that time is limited, and this is why he moves faster with these plans. Yes, yes, I I believe that to be the case. Now, just one final question about this Parkinson's topic. I, I appreciate that I've I'm maybe asking too many questions. 
if I'm reading a book of Hitler's speeches or his, you know, his writings, do you think that there is a certain point uh, in time where I should be start watching for signs that you know his mind is, um, you know, slowed down by his problems? At, at what at, at at what point do you think that I should be reading more closely for signs of this? Uh, Boris, uh, Adolf Hitler uh, stopped his public appearances uh, some time prior to the termination of World War II. Uh, Joseph Goebbels, <laughs> and so I think Joseph Goebbels was asked to take over the uh, w what had obviously been a strength of Germany, which had been Hitler's oratory. It was frenzied, as you know. It was a screaming sort of oratory. Uh, if you read his speeches, they were uh, not very impressive, but his his delivery uh, seemed to mesmerize uh, his audiences and uh, were were sufficient to mobilize a war weary populace to go to war again in uh, in uh, 1939. So um, when he lost that ability to speak. I think Germany lost uh, some degree of, of strength of their of their dictator of their Führer. Um, I, in terms of his uh, his abilities, uh, the best information that I can that I know of are the writings and the interviews that were done of his uh, colleagues uh, toward uh, at the end of World War II, and they noticed that his thinking, that his movements. Were, were slowed up uh, substantially, uh, that uh, he was no longer able to keep up with the amount of information that was coming in. At one point, he'd been very good about that and had a, uh, a very uh, quick mind in terms of keeping up with uh, information, but this was lost to him. Uh, but at the same time, he was becoming more stubborn, more rigid, more inflexible, and rather than uh, delegating more responsibility, he took in more responsibility for himself, which again impaired the performance of the German forces. And so Hitler, he was not, I would just like to, uh, while he was not formally educated, he was not, uh, he, he was not a, Stupid person. If he was a, if he was, if if we could somehow test him, uh, you know, in one of these intellectual tests, he would probably score a healthy score. It was he was not dumb per exactly. se. It, it, exactly. He he was he was not dumb. He was uh, uh, mentally quick, uh, just poorly educated and unsophisticated. Well. Mm. I would like to thank you. It was very, very enlightening interview. But before we part, there is one final question because, as I said before, we are creatures of tradition on this show. There's a, a traditional opening question and there's a traditional conclusion which we must have. You know, because this is a show about books and about reading, I would like to ask can you tell us a little bit about what you are reading right now? Maybe there is something you could recommend to us. It doesn't have to be about military history. I understand that you are not necessarily reading about that, but I would <laughs> like to hear about your own book journey. Well, I'd be pleased to share that. Uh, uh, something I have um, I just read, which again is about Hitler, but it's a different approach. The title is Defying Hitler, a memoir by Sebastian Hafner. And this is a personal account by this author, that is a pen name, by the way, a personal account of the rise of Nazism. And it's written by this German citizen who was forced to flee. But how subtle some of these early changes were, but in looking back, it was so obvious at where Germany was headed, uh, and it was so difficult for many people to, to see. So uh, that's a, a book that, that I thought puts this all in very personal, one-person terms that, uh, that, that I enjoyed. Another book that I have I've really just gotten, I'm just beginning, completely different topic, is The People's 
Hospital. And this is by Ricardo Nuila, N-U-I-L-A. And he is a physician who practices at the Ben Taub Hospital in Houston. Ben Taub is the county hospital for Harris County. And it really tells the story of five people who cannot access adequate health care. And it's due to a variety of reasons. Uh, some of them don't seem to uh, uh, be able to access the state Medicaid, or some of them were illegal and could not pass immigration status for health insurance, uh, so that they all had challenges that they were facing, but how they received their good quality health care at the Ben Hob Taub Hospital. I also went through Ben Taub as a, a medical student, and uh, so this this book has certain meaning for me. The healthcare there is is excellent, but of course it's a, a charity hospital for Harris County. Uh, a third book I might just mention, and this is one that I hope no one has a need to read, but it's called The Bereaved Parent by Harriet Sarnoff Schiff, S C H I F F. Uh, in um, my instance, we tragically had the uh, suicide of a young man who was just 19, had just completed his first year at Harvard, uh, not blood relative, but we were very close to him and his family. And this I, I'm book sorry that we need to, I'm sorry that we are forced to bring this up in such a public setting. This was not my intent. Well, no, I, I don't mind talking about it. It's just a book that if people have to deal with such a loss of a young person, it's a book that I can recommend. Uh, it, it really is uh, quite on the mark, I think. Tom, I was very pleased to have you here. You're, uh, you've provided many insights of on, uh, on, on subjects which I have always been uh, of interest to me. And of course, some of the things which I didn't quite uh, fully understand in your book, I'm happy that you've uh, cleared them up. Um, Thank you for having you here uh, with us today. If there is, if in the future you want to write about Jean Dark, uh, Jean Dark, or about uh, uh, Goebbels, so we are always here to have you if you like. Well, thank you. It's been a, a pleasure to be on your show, and uh, I, I thank you again for asking me to participate. <laughs>